open the Word of God every week because, as I said earlier, we want to know what message God has communicated to us. And so if you turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, God wrote this book. He wrote it in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through His Apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. And you might want to also put your hand in Isaiah 53, because that's quoted several times in this section that we're going to be looking at this morning, Isaiah 53 as well. I told you the last few weeks that a main theme of this letter has been suffering. It's a main theme of the book. Yes, it's been evangelism as well, but suffering has been a key word that is used over and over throughout the book of 1 Peter. These are believers. We see in verse 1 of chapter 1, they are scattered, they're aliens scattered throughout regions, and persecution is upon them. They're feeling it. They're feeling what it's like to be ostracized from their society, what it's like to um, be silenced in their society, what it's like to face the uh, ridicule of their society. They are feeling all of that. It's only going to get worse, though, but they, they see that coming, and they're experiencing that. They've fled as we, because they're scattered. You get the idea they've fled from their homes into different regions. Notice some of the other passages. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, this is 1 6, even for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, all kinds of trials. Go down to verse uh, 13 of chapter 3. Flip over to chapter 3, verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Go down to verse 17. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves, this is verse 1 of chapter 4, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Verse 12 of chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you 4 16 first peter 4 16 but if anyone suffers as a christian he is not to be ashamed but is to glorify god in this name verse 19 of chapter 4 Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And then finally, chapter 5, verse 10, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Jesus said this, folks. He said, they hated me, they will hate you. Do not be surprised by that. He says, do not be surprised by that persecution. They persecuted me as well. And he says, even though you are being persecuted, don't lose sight of the fact that you are to also reach your persecutors. You're also to view your persecutors as the mission field. You're to view your persecutors as those who are in need of salvation, and God wants to use you to reach the very ones that are persecuting you. You do this by, as we've seen in our study so far, 1 Peter, he says, by practicing good deeds, good deeds, that they might see them and be drawn to your Savior and glorify God in the day of their visitation. That's a hard message for us as American Christians to think about. To see this as an opportunity for the gospel, to see the losing of so many freedoms in our society, the losing of so many things that we have held dear in our country, and even among us as Christians, to realize that there are efforts to silence what we believe. There are efforts to ridicule what we stand for and to attack the morals that we promote. 
It is difficult for us as American Christians to, not, to understand that persecution is the norm. What we've experienced for the last 200 years in this country is not normal to the rest of the world. The rest of the world, to say you were a Christian, meant persecution. To say you're a Christian in America for many years has been it's been a lot of things. You could be very nominal, and that's fine. It's been very cultural in our society. To be a Christian in our country now is, on many fronts, to be ridiculed for that, to be ostracized for that, to be very similar to what the believers in Peter's day were experiencing, to be um, marginalized, to be persecuted in many different ways. The schools you might attend may start asking you where you stand on certain moral issues. Jobs you want to take, where do you stand on certain moral issues? It may even be dangerous one day to say you attend Grace Church when they listen to some of our sermons online. There's a cost that we are not familiar with a cost, a price in following Christ that we have not been familiar with in our history. And it's starting to become very unsettling for many of us as believers to think that we are suffering unjustly. We're trying to do what is right and we're facing persecution for it. That is exactly what Peter is speaking to in First Peter, to those believers. Maybe some of you don't want to become a Christian. Maybe you're here this morning, I don't want to become a Christian. Or maybe you're listening to me online, I don't want to become a Christian because I don't want to be identified with you who are being persecuted. I don't want to identify with people who are being persecuted. And maybe that's something in your mind, I just don't want to trust Jesus. I don't want to carry that cross. And that is why I say I think the very reason, the very reason I hold to the sovereignty of God and salvation is because God must do a work in me that makes me see Christ more valuable than anything I could possibly go through. That Christ is more valuable. I want Him more than whatever the cross is that I must bear. Christ is more attractive than any excuses, and he overwhelms any excuses that I might have. Sometimes, aren't you amazed, as Ben said last week, that you wake up and you're still a Christian? Because it's God who called you, it's God who placed you in this, it's God who's called you to even suffer, if that's what's needed. It's God who is in control of these things. It's God who is willing these things. The universe is not out of control. He's just as in control today as he's ever been. And as we read in a verse earlier, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. It's not some strange thing. It's not strange in the mind of God at all. God is in control of everything. And so Peter has said, even in the midst of all this suffering that you are experiencing, he's saying, do good deeds. Do good deeds in respect to submitting to government. Don't do the way the world does it. Submit to your governing authorities. Unless they ask you to tell you to do something sinful, don't do that. But he says, don't be defiant toward your governing authorities. Don't let the world see that being a Christian is supernatural. Our responses to things are different than the world's responses. If you're an employee and your employer is a difficult employer, he's saying, don't let the world, don't respond the way the world respond to that, as we saw last week. Complain and, and attack. But he says, be submissive in that environment as well, unless they ask you to sin, of course. Next week, we're going to see wives in the relationship to a difficult husband to be in submission that you might win your husband. 
doesn't unless they ask you to sin or something. We're going to see that that's an approach we don't think of. That's an approach the world does not apply to anything. We're so rights-oriented, and we defend our rights, and we uphold our rights, and we fight for our rights. But that's very contrary to what Jesus, or excuse me, what Peter is telling these believers who are suffering unjustly. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. To suffer for his sake. Prosperity preachers leave that verse out, don't they? And so the question is, can I have an example of somebody who suffered unjustly? Can I have somebody who was righteous and suffered unjustly? And in verse 21, Peter says, well, you've got Christ. Verse 21, we talked about it last week briefly. But since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. This is 1 Peter 2, 21. Leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Just, just look at how Christ did it. Look how Christ did it and, and, and what he said. That's what you have here. What he said. And he's our pattern, and he's our example of what you do when you face this kind of suffering, unjust suffering. He's our, uh, it's like you ever taught your child or uh, your child learned how to, or maybe you learned it to, no, you didn't learn. This is learning how to write in cursive. You learn how to write in cursive and when you were in school and you were younger, possibly, and what they would do is they would give you a page that had the letters all written perfectly and you'd put your tracing paper on top of it and you would try to trace that letter, right? That's what it means by the word example. I'm to, it's like following in the footsteps of someone. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm tracing their steps. I'm putting my steps in their steps. Because I, he is my example of how to do this. Notice it says, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. That's out of Isaiah 53, by the way. As he was moving toward the cross, you would think the opportunity of a man who is about to die unjustly, a man that has facing what he had to face in that moment, you would think deceit would come out of his mouth. You would think Verse 23, he would revile in return. You would think that a natural man would just do that. But says Christ did not do that. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He did not sin with his mouth. That's what we're told in these verses. And even though he was being treated unjustly, You would, you would think that he would hate his enemies. You would think that he would be bitter towards his enemies. You would think that he would revile back. You, you would think that he would do those things that are natural to a man and to a woman. But he says he did not do those things. He received all kinds of reviling. It means he was reviled or, or with, with vile verbal abuse. This happened all his life. He was, a, he was accused of being the, the son of a, a legitimate, he was an illegitimate child. He was accused of that. He was, he was accused of being a glutton, a drunkard, possessed by demons, an ally of Satan, a deceiver, a tax evader, a false teacher. He was called all of those things. And then he went through his crucifixion, up to his crucifixion. He went through, he was falsely accused in the trials. They'd bring in false, false witnesses who would make up stories about him. He went through six trials, all illegal trials, in front of the Sanhedrin, done in the middle of the night, which was illegal. He was unjustly beaten. He was mocked. He was mocked while he was on the cross. People would come up and mock him. You saved others, can't you save yourself? He was mocked by the other thieves on the cross. One of them did come to salvation, but the point is, that's what he faced. That's the suffering he faced. He was mocked. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was reviled. He was cursed at. It's almost like Peter is saying, now what exactly is your problem with suffering? It's almost like he's saying, what exactly are you, kind of suffering are you going through? 
It's almost like he wants them to say, this is what Christ went through. This is what Christ went through. And I think the key to it all, you see at the end of verse 23, he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And I think this is so important for you and I. I think this is something we have to really do or you're going to get bitter. Or you're going to get bitter. You're going to get angry. And it's going to come out and it's going to be inside of you and it's going to come out. When you are treated unfairly and you've used all the avenues maybe to address the situation, whatever it is, but when that runs out and you're just treated unfairly, Entrusting yourself to him. Entrusting yourself to him means you see beyond these accusers. You see beyond the judges in that courtroom that he was facing. You see beyond all of that. And you see a God who is in control of everything. You see a God who is going to one day hold court and justice will truly prevail at that court hearing. It may not happen here in this life, but one day it will. And that's what he's, he's pointing to, kept entrusting to him who judges righteously. There are no totally righteous judges. We're all sinners. This, one, this man was without sin, and he will be our judge one day. And he will vindicate, he will vindicate himself. He will vindicate us. And that's what we have to look forward to. It may not happen in this life. But he saw past that. And my friends, we have to do that. We have to look past those people that march for uh, abortion rights and people who march for gay rights and people who march for whatever rights they're wanting to uphold that go against the word of God. We just have to look past them. Pray for them. Opportunity to speak truth in love. Do it. But we have to look past them. If we don't, we'll be bitter. I have to be, I, and you don't want to be a bitter person. You don't want to be an angry person. It comes out in your speech. It comes out in how you talk. It comes out of all of us. Keep entrusting yourself. It means keep handing yourself over to him. As the waves of persecution come, as the waves of accusation come, as the waves of whatever it is that is is unjust comes just keep handing it over to God see past those events my God is bigger than all of that don't get bogged down in just what you see recognize God is bigger God is bigger and God wants to use us to reach our persecutors he doesn't want us to make them our enemies. He doesn't want us to stand on the street corners and try to shout louder than they shout to somehow control the narrative. Jesus did that on the cross, didn't he? Father, into your hands I give my spirit. Jesus forgave his persecutors from the cross. We cannot return evil for evil, Paul says. We have to do the, and see, this is what we've been saying throughout this. We have to show the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ is life transforming. It's not natural. There's nothing natural, there's nothing supernatural about you loving people that love you. There's nothing supernatural about you um, giving to people who give to you. That's nothing supernatural about that. You don't get a pat on the back for that. Everybody does that. Tax gatherers do that, Jesus says. What's supernatural is when you love your enemy. What's supernatural is when you don't revile in return or return evil for evil. And just keep entrusting yourself to him who judges righteously. You need to get a bigger God. That's your problem. You need to get a bigger God that's bigger than that that's going on. You need to study the attributes of God and understand who God is and understand his sovereign hand and understand his power and understand that vengeance is his and he will judge righteously. He will not let the guilty go unpunished. But that's not your job or my job. I am to do good deeds 
to silence my critics. I am to do good deeds that will show them that the gospel is real, that it's true, that Jesus' message is, is the truth, and put that on display. And God will be vindicated, and He will vindicate. And then he moves into verses 24 and 25, and this is where I want to spend the remainder of our time. And this is a very important section. It's almost like he, he, he does a subtle shift here in verses 24 through 25. This is, uh, let me read, let me, we were, they were read earlier to you, um, verses 24 and 25. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've been returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. It's like the first three verses were just telling you events in his life, and the end, toward the end of his life, and now he talks about what he did, what he did, his work on the cross, the suffering on the cross, as you can imagine, but coming to the cross. You know what it is, I think? I think that Peter does not want you to think that Jesus is just came into the world to be an example. It's not that he just came to be a good example to us. He's not Gandhi-like. It's not like he came into the world and said, here, do what I do. That Though there is a truth in that for us as Christians to see and want to be like Christ, but that's not the why he came. Listen, if he did not do verse 24, I could never follow his example in 21 and 22 and 23. If he did not do verse 24, I had to be redeemed. I had to, something had to happen to make me right with God. So I could even do that example thing in those verses. It's almost like he wants to say, he didn't come just to be a model, but he came to be a mediator. Expiatory, he came to atone for sin. This is about substitution, and that's what substitution means. It means that, Christ died for us. We should have died, but he died instead. That's substitution. We're the sinners. He's without sin. We should have died. He died in our place. That's what he's teaching here. That's what he's teaching us here. So this is very theological, but it's very important uh, I can mimic verses 21, 22, and 23. Yeah, we can mimic that, but I can't mimic this suffering. This is only a work that he could do because he was without sin. I'm a sinful man. Sinful man could not do this because it would not satisfy anything in the eyes of God. What he did satisfied God, satisfied God's wrath on sinners. And so, he was a sinless substitute. And I I just say this, a lot of people like to talk about Jesus as being the example. They don't like verse 24, though. A lot of people like to talk about Jesus' love, Jesus' kindness, Jesus' giving, Jesus doing all these great things, and we should be more like Jesus. And I agree with those things, except I recognize I can't do any of those things without verse 24. They don't like verse 24 because they say verse 24 is cruel. What kind of God would send people to hell? What kind of God, does, what, what kind of God would, sit, would, would have his own son crucified? That's cosmic child abuse, they would say. That's what liberal theologians are saying about these verses. The doctrine of penal substitution, a penalty was he was paying the price, the penalty, our penalty for us. What's, what kind of father would do that to his son? But anyway, this is, it's the truth he did. It's the reason we're here this morning, because this is true. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you are healed. Listen, there was a doctrine that went around uh, that basically said Jesus did not have a body. 
And what died on the cross was not really, it's just an illusionary. It wasn't really a body. No, this says he had a body. Thomas, look at my hands. He had a body. A body thou hast prepared for me, Hebrews 10 says, or 9 says. He had a body. His body on the cross, the word bore, interesting word, he bore means to carry up. Old Testament language to the sacrificial system. Lambs were carried up to the altar. A lamb bore. A lamb was carried up to the altar, and the priest would lay the lamb on the altar, and that lamb would be slaughtered in front of the people. That's the picture. That lamb was slaughtered. That lamb became sin. That lamb all the sins of the people were placed on that lamb. It's certainly a picture. They didn't really take away anything. It was just a picture, a covering, something to do in obedience to God. It foreshadowed what Christ would one day do. But the point is, Christ, what happened to that lamb happened to Christ. He was laid on an altar to be slaughtered. He was slaughtered in our place. Abraham took his son, bore his son, took his son up to the altar and put him on the altar as a sacrifice. And then God provided a ram. But the point is that foreshadowed what God would do to his son, the Lord Jesus Go to Isaiah 53.10 just for a moment. Isaiah 53.10, just flip back there. Isaiah 53.10, just hold your hand in Isaiah and 1 Peter. We'll be flipping back and forth. Isaiah 53.10 says this, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. See that? The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, God crushed his son Jesus. That's the point. God crushed his son Jesus. Go to verse 4. Go down back up to verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Go down to verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for, his, for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So that's what Peter's doing. Christ, in 1 Peter 2.24, Christ bore our sins. Sins, you know what that word means. It means falling short. Sins, sin means there's a target out there and you've missed the mark. Harmatia, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God has a holy standard. We fall short of God's holiness, every one of us. The standard is perfection and none of us can get there. The standard is holiness and none of us can get there. So we're all sinners. We fall short of God's standard, and we fall short, therefore, of God's purpose for our lives. And we deserve to be punished. The wages of that sin is death. And this is what this verse is saying. This verse says, Jesus willingly bore the consequences of our sin. He bore the consequences of our sinful actions, internal, external. And then he endured the wrath of God. God crushed him. He endured the wrath of God in our place. So Peter's saying that substitution died for our sins, died in our place. Jesus experienced something he had never experienced as the second person of the Trinity. He experienced separation from God. When he hung on the cross, God made him who no sin become sin. God could not look on sin. God turned his back on Christ and judged him as a sinner, though he was not a sinner. All my sin was placed on Jesus and it was Judge. He was, he was judged 
for my rebellion. He was rejudged for my lust. He was uh, judged for my pride, for my greed, for your selfishness, my selfishness, my anger, my lies, your lies, your cheating, your stealing, our filthy thoughts, our impure motives, all of our evil deeds. Every, all of that, God put on Jesus and judged him. God crushed him. Because the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins must die. And I should have been there dying, but he died in my place. And that's what Peter is saying. He did that for us. He bore our sins on the cross, in his body on the cross. And so you need to realize that. You need to realize that, yeah, it was the Jews, and yeah, it was the Romans, and yeah, it was Pilate, and yeah, it was uh, the Sanhedrin, but it was you, you as well, that put Christ on the cross because that's what he died for was sins. A lot of people went through Roman crucifixions, but not everybody who went through Roman crucifixion bore the wrath of God. God put him there. God put the only perfect person to ever live. He put him on the cross and judged him. He made him sin and judged that sin. And Peter's not saying it's just their sins, it's his sins as well. You see that in verse 24, our sins. So your translation might say tree. He bore his sins on the tree, his body on a tree. Uh, keep in mind, a tree would have been Old Testament, more Old Testament language. The word is actually wood. Bore, his, bore our sins in his body on the wood. Jews did not crucify people. They stoned people. But if somebody did something really bad, Deuteronomy tells us they would hang them on a tree. Their body on a tree. It had to be taken down at a certain time, but they would hang the body on a tree. That was the complete humiliation to be hung from a tree. That showed the seriousness of the crime, to be hung from a tree after you had been killed already. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So it was a curse. He took the curse for us. He, he cursed Jesus in our place. So that, you see, so that in that verse, so that, why? So he did all of this so that I could just go on living how I want to live. Is that what happened? He did all of that for me so I could just be the same person that I've always been. No, notice what it says, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There's some people that think that, just pray a prayer and then go on and live your life however you want to. That's, that's not true belief. That's not true faith. That's not saving faith. Saving faith does something to me. It changes me. I'm saved from sin. And now I recognize I'm saved also from the power of sin. And I no longer want to continue living in the sin that I've been saved from. I don't do that perfectly. I don't do that this every day real well. But the point is that becomes now my pursuit as a Christian, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. You see the parallel? He himself bore our sins in his body, verse 24, so we might die to sins. He bore our sins, so we might die to those sins. Go to chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Peter. He says in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now I want to live the rest of my time on this earth, for the will of God. For the time already passed is sufficient, for you have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, 
having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, idolatries. He's just reminding them there of their former lifestyle. Those days are behind you. Now you need to live to righteousness. We know in the book of Romans, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 6, if you can hold three places at once, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, this is a great explanation of sanctification in Romans chapter 6. He's talked about our justification. We're made right by, through, by faith in Christ alone. But this is the so that, so that we might die to sin chapter of Romans. He says, Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In other words, we're a new creation. We're new creatures in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. My friends, this is, a, this is what it means to be a Christian. Newness of life. New creation. Transform life. That's what Christ does to the believer. It's not that you just become the same. It's not the same. And what the world needs to see is we're just not the same as our former days. Verse 6, go down to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Even so, verse 11 Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, so the next time you're tempted to sin, which will be today, the next time you're tempted to sin, you can say, and, and maybe this is a sinful habit that you've struggled with your whole life, you can say, hey, listen, I'm dead to you. You're not my master anymore. I don't have to listen to you. There was a day I was your slave, but now I have a new master. I'm now a slave of Christ. I don't have to listen to you. I can listen to what Christ says. It doesn't mean you will have victory all the time, but listen, that's what you can do that you could not do before. Verse 12 of chapter 6, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So stop using your eyes, stop using your hands, stop using your mouth, your ears, your, your feet. Stop using them to do sinful stuff. That's what he's saying. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So why? Because Christ bore our sins on the cross. Therefore, we are dead to our sin. We can say no. Go to verse 17 of Romans 6. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Go back to 1 Peter. So we can now live a life that is pleasing to him. What, what does it mean to live a righteous life? It just means simply this, to do what's right. That's all. Just to do what's right. And if I need to know what right is, I just go to the Bible and I'll start with the Ten Commandments there. I have God's word on what it means to do what is right. That's what righteousness means to practice righteousness. Just do what is right. Get up every day and say, God, help me do what is right today, right in your eyes. Verse, two, verse 24, for by his wounds you are healed. Let me be brief on this, but the point of that is simply that it doesn't mean physical healing. The reason I know that is because we're talking about sins. Sins is not a physical problem. It may be manifested in your physical life, but we're talking about an inward problem. We're talking about more than just what you do on the outside. We're talking about inward. He died for sins. He died for desires. He died for cravings. There's some people that want to make that, that Jesus' atonement on the cross heals everybody of sickness. That is not true. You have Trophimus, uh, Trophimus, excuse me, you have Epaphrodites, you have Timothy, you have Paul himself. 
all with ailments and sicknesses, and they weren't healed. God doesn't heal everybody with physical sickness. It's not the only place there's ever going to be no disease or sicknesses in heaven. John MacArthur says this, your forgiveness from sin will last longer than your health. That is because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, not to write a prescription for your sickness. He was made sin for us, not a disease. He was not made a disease. He was made sin. And then look at, this, look at the next verse, verse 25. Christ is our shepherd, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And he quotes from Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He's a shepherd. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. Jesus says, uh, uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, we see verses in uh, Luke 19, maybe, where uh, the shepherd goes, leaves the 99 to go after the one. The, the shepherd metaphor is used over and over again, talking about God, talking about Christ. If you recall in Ezekiel 34, the leaders of Israel were bad shepherds of the people. Listen to some of the things that God says from Ezekiel 34. He confronts those shepherds in Israel. He says, my people, they were scattered for lack of a shepherd and they became food for every beast. My flock wandered in the mountains. My flock were scattered everywhere. You, you guys have dropped the ball, he's saying to the shepherds of Israel. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek Seek them out as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he's in, among his scattered sheep. And I will care for my sheep, my sheep, and I will deliver them from all the places to which they are scattered. I will bring them from all the countries, and I will bring them to their own land, and I will feed them. I will give them a good pasture. I will lie down on a good grazing ground and feed them rich pastures. I will feed my flock, verse 15 of that chapter says, I will lead them to rest. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered. That's a prophecy of the Messiah. That's what Jesus has done. You were a scattered sheep. You were a wandering sheep. And he brought you into his fold. He says, now you have returned, verse 25, the first Peter 2. Now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. It's talking about Jesus. The word returned it isn't the idea that they were once Christians and now they weren't Christians and they come back to be Christians. That's not the idea. It's the idea that they were, had their back on God and now they've turned around to go to God. That's what that means. They had turned their backs on God. They had wandered away from God, left God, and now they've returned. That's repentance. That's Repentance. And keep in mind, we're talking to persecuted believers who need to be reminded of this. He is the guardian of your souls. He is the protector of your, of your lives, your very lives. He is sovereign. He loves you. You're part of his fold. And so he's giving them hope in this. You belong to Christ. And so maybe you're here this morning and, and you know that you are lost in your sin. You know that you are lost in your sin, that you have fallen short of the holiness of God, that you have, fallen sh you have offended the holiness of God. And you need somebody to rescue you because you know you're, you are headed for hell. You will face the consequences of that. The soul that sins must die. The wages of sin is death, eternal death, but I want to tell you something. You can come to him this morning. You can turn to the shepherd. That's what Peter says. You can turn to the shepherd and just acknowledge, acknowledge, it's my sin to put you on that cross. It's my, the way I think. It's the things I've done. Those very sins, they put you on the cross. And I cling to the one who bore my sin in my place, who bore the penalty of my sin in my place. 
and I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And one day when you stand before God, you can say to him, when he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? You can say to him, because I trusted in the one who came into the world to save me from my sin. I trust in Jesus to take me to heaven. You're not gonna be able to say, well, I went to Grace Church, isn't that enough? No, that's not enough. Or I gave money, or I did all these great things, good things. That's not, that's not gonna get you into heaven. The only thing that God will say, come into my heaven, will be if you say, I trust in Jesus to bring me here. I don't know that God's gonna stand there and ask anybody that question, but if he did, that's what you would say if you were a Christian. Maybe you're here this morning and you wandered away and you want to come back. Now, that's not what this passage is talking about necessarily, but that happens. That happens to believers. We wander away at times and we need to come back. The shepherd is arms wide open. Arms wide open. And come back. Repent. Identify the sin that separates you from God in terms of fellowship with God and and repent and just turn back to him. Peter fell away. Peter knows what it is to fall away. He fell away. He denied Christ three times. Jesus told him he would. He says, I'll never do that. Well, he did it anyway. Ends up denying Christ three times and he's restored in John 21. It's, it's wonderful as a Christian to be able to grow in grace, isn't it? Because <laughs> we need it all the time. We need grace every day. We need grace every day. So, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for all that you have done in providing our salvation through what Christ did for us on the cross. We praise you and we love you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.